Hello and welcome. I am Dr. John O'Kane from the University of Washington Sports Medicine Clinic, and I am assisted today by Lori Sabado, who is our Director of Physical Therapy at the Sports Medicine Clinic, and we're going to talk to you about common running injuries. Um, the injuries that we're going to deal with affect the hip, the knee, and also the foot. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to review overuse injuries in general. Normally, uh, running injuries are not acute injuries like turning an ankle or twisting a knee, but more commonly they come on uh, insidiously. Initially, there's a process of microtrauma where damage takes place at a cellular level, then inflammation follows that, and eventually, if it's not treated, you actually end up with uh, tendon or tissue degeneration. Usually, those injuries follow some type of repetitive activity, so running is a classic uh, activity that can cause an overuse injury. Generally, the onset is insidious, so they're barely noticed, and then they become increasingly painful, and then eventually, they become limiting. Um, there are two factors that are very important in overuse injuries. One are training errors, and this commonly occurs when people go out and they try doing too much too quickly. Uh, they jump right into a 5 to 10 mile running program without working their way up to that appropriately. Um, usually about 10% a week in terms of increasing the distance you do is a safe measure. Uh, inadequate rest is also a factor, so jumping into a running program and going every day and not giving yourself rest days can also be a problem. Inadequate fuel, where you're not taking in adequate calories to make up for your training can be an issue. Um, poor or excessively worn equipment can be a problem, and usually if you're talking about running, you're going to be talking about shoes, and we'll deal with that more later. And then terrain changes can also be an issue. So if you move from an area that's very flat and suddenly you live in a hilly area and try to do your same workout on hills, that could be a big change in the stresses and, uh, and result in overuse injuries. Biomechanical issues, which we're going to deal with a fair bit today, include malalignment, uh, poor flexibility where certain muscles are tight, or strength deficits where certain muscles are weak, and they can all contribute to overuse injuries. Um, another issue that's very important is you can have an injury uh, such as an ankle sprain uh, or, or a muscle strain that is, not completely, that is not completely rehabilitated, and because of that incomplete rehabilitation, then an overuse injury can come up at another location. Um, generally, when you have overuse injuries, the treatment principles start with rest. It's important not to keep running uh, when it's causing pain. Um, ice initially is very important. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are medications like ibuprofen and Aleve, can be helpful in the acute setting uh, in terms of decreasing that inflammation. Modifying the training errors that exist and then addressing the biomechanics are also important. Um, so let's now talk about some specific injuries. We're going to start with the hip, and we're going to talk about trochanteric bursitis, uh, strains and tendonitis in the hip muscles, and then also we're going to talk a little bit about stress fractures. Um, trochanteric bursitis, the trochanter is this bone here on the outside of the hip, and this is an area that can commonly become tender in runners. Uh, the iliotibial band, which we'll talk about a lot today, is a very important structure that uh, it's connective tissue that attaches to three muscles up here and then goes and crosses over the greater trochanter and goes all the way down and attaches at the bottom of the knee. Um, if you get ex this band rubs back and forth over the greater trochanter, which is this hip bone right here, and that rubbing can cause pain and inflammation, which is uh, trochanteric bursitis. You can also get tendonitis uh, where these hip external rotators, the muscles that allow you to externally rotate the hip, come in and attach to that bone. Um, usually the, the symptoms include pain and tenderness right in this area, and you may have a little bit of distal radiation of that pain down along that iliotibial band. Sometimes, too, you can get snapping of that band over that bone. Um, in terms of the biomechanics, if that iliotibial band is tight, that increases the friction across here, and that can be part of the problem. In addition, if your hip has excessive pronation or internal rotation, that stretches that band more over that bone, and that can cause a problem. Um, excessive pronation at the foot or subtalar pronation can also have a tendency to turn that hip and turn that knee in, and so that can aggravate the problem. And then finally, tightness or weakness of these hip external rotators, limiting their ability to correct that pronation. Uh, that, that can also uh, be a factor that, that causes this problem. In terms of rehabilitation, stretching of the iliotibial band, strengthening those hip stabilizing muscles, and correcting that pr uh, pronation can all be important. And Laurie's going to review some of that for you. I'm going to show several ITB stretches throughout this program. In the first stretch, I'm going to show it standing. What we're, we're going to start is we're going to bring the leg behind your um, non-stretched leg. So we're going to stretch this leg here. And what I'm going to do is lean my hips to the side and forward, and I'm going to attempt to keep my body in line with my hips, thereby stretching the outside of my um, hip muscle. 
that would be a good stretch for your ITB. Another good stabilization kind of exercise or strengthening type of exercise is where you bring your leg out to the side. You can do it in this manner or you can do it with surgical tubing around your ankles and you can bring your leg up and out to the side in this manner and strengthening the muscles on the side of the hip. Um, a good stabilization exercise you can do for your ITB so that you, there's not a lot of rubbing there is when you stand, you can stand on one leg. Typically, sometimes you see people who have weak hip muscles tend to stand like this. What I'm going to do is attempt to stand on one leg and I can further challenge that by even moving my opposite leg around, really challenging um, the stability of my hip muscle. All right, great. Thanks, Lori. Um, the next thing I want to move on to are hip strains and tendinitis. Um, there are a number of different muscles in your hip that can be strained. Uh, usually the ones that uh, we encounter most frequently are the iliopsoas muscle, which runs right down here along the front of the hip, and that usually causes pain right in this area. Um, another muscle that can become involved are the hip adductor muscles, which run along the inside of the thigh and help you bring your legs together. And then the rectus femoris is an additional muscle that's a thigh muscle that comes up and attaches right up in here, and that can also cause pain. Usually if you have a muscle strain, you have pain trying to use that muscle. So if it's a hip flexor, Lori would have pain coming into this position, or if she tries to passively flex that muscle. So if she brings her hip back and, excuse me, passively extends and stretches that muscle, then that will also cause pain. Um, what, uh, in terms of the biomechanics, there's a couple of different issues that can cause hip strains or tendonitis. One is weakness of those muscles, and the other is poor flexibility. So both of those are factors that sometimes need to be corrected. Another thing that can be an issue is uh, if you have an injury to one of these muscles and then you don't rehabilitate it as you get back to your running program, uh, then that muscle can be uh, subject to further injury or other muscles surrounding that can be injured as well. In terms of the rehabilitation, initially you want to rest the injured muscle. Um, you want to try to gradually get that muscle going as your symptoms allow. You want to stretch it as tolerated but not stretched through the point of pain. You want to strengthen it with weight-bearing exercises. You want to try to correct altered biomechanics when they exist and then gradually return to full activity. And Laurie's going to go through some of that now. One of the stretching muscles that, or stretching exercises that you could do for a hip flexor is when you bring your knee back behind your hip and put a stretch across the front of your um, hip. Um, the way people sometimes will do it incorrectly is they'll do something like this where they'll stretch through their lower back and what you want to do is keep your back relatively neutral and stretch here. You can further stretch it by even going down onto the knee and I can feel it where you can pull that stretch not only across the hip flexor but you'll probably get some of your quad involved. Another stretch that you can do for your hip or your adductor muscle that uh, John was talking about is bring your leg off to the side. You can do it like this. You can even do it uh, sitting down with your leg out to the side and stretch your adductor muscles. Strengthening exercises, again, we could do something as simple as surgical tubing. So we'll take the tubing and what I'll do is I'll attempt to bend my hip or flex my hip against resistance like this. Or we can do the same thing for the adductor muscles. So if, John, you could hang on to that, we could do a strengthening exercise where you'll bring your leg toward the inside if he doesn't pull me over. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> um, uh, the next thing I want to do is touch on stress fractures a little bit. Um, stress fractures can occur uh, in the hips, in the leg bones, and also in the feet related to running. We're going to deal specifically with one hip stress fracture today. But before we get into that, I would like to talk just a little bit about stress fractures in general. Normal bone is always remodeling. In other words, it's breaking down and then rebuilding. Um, stress fractures occur if the stresses causing the breakdown are too excessive so that the bone cannot remodel fast enough or if the bone remodeling process is interfered with. Um, there's, uh, the factors that can cause excessive loading of the bone are the training errors, which we've discussed already, and then there's a number of intrinsic factors that are associated with stress fractures in the lower extremity. One is a history of prior stress fracture. So if you've had one stress fracture, you're much more likely to have a second one. Significant leg length differences can be an issue. Hard playing surfaces, so if you do all of your running on concrete, that can be an issue. Um, very high arches, uh, or what we call excessive subtalar supination, where your feet tend to turn out can be an issue. Poor flexibility is a factor, and also having small calves is actually a factor for uh, stress fractures in your lower extremities. Um, in terms of risk factors that weaken bone, there are uh, some metabolic insults that can be an issue. One is inactivity. So if you 
sprain an ankle and are unable to run for six weeks and then go back to running and jump right back into your same program, your bones are no longer trained for that same level of activity and that can cause a stress fracture. Um, certain diseases can cause stress fractures. Medications including glucocorticoids, um, those are medications like prednisone that people might be taking for medical conditions such as asthma for instance. Uh, those medications can uh, affect bone metabolism and then nutritional deficiencies including uh, insufficient calories for your training program, inadequate calcium or inadequate vitamin D can also be an issue. There are some gender specific factors that are worth mentioning. Uh, in women, estrogen is very important to maintain bone health and to maintain bone density. And so when women go through menopause and their estrogen drops, their bones tend to weaken. Uh, that's one of the reason that one of the reasons that uh, doctors recommend that women around menopause come in to talk to their physicians about estrogen replacement. Uh, whether or not you replace estrogen is, is a large topic and it depends on a number of other issues, but, um, but it can help maintain bone density and so it's important to have that discussion with your physician. Um, there's also an issue called the female athlete triad that's getting more and more press lately. Uh, the triad is defined as amenorrhea, which means an absence of normal periods, um, disordered eating, which can be as severe as anorexia or bulimia, um, but can also be as simple as just not taking in enough calories to make up for what you're burning off with your running. And then finally, osteoporosis that results from, uh, from the inadequate calories and the inadequate estrogen can follow. Um, I think that uh, it, it's important that all, of these that all of these issues are addressed when someone is presenting with something that could be a stress fracture. The stress fractures that cause pain in the hip area are the pubic ramus, and the pubic ramus is a bone that runs in the front of the pelvis, pelvis right through here, and so pain is usually in this location. The proximal femoral shaft, which is the upper thigh bone, which usually will cause pain in this location, and then lastly, the femoral neck, and that's the one we're gonna deal with, and that femoral neck is the very top of the, of the humerus excuse me, of the femur, and it comes up and attaches, uh, the hip bone comes out through the femoral neck, and we'll show that on the next picture. Um, the, uh, usually the pain that people complain of is insidious pain that gradually gets worse. Initially you just notice it only with running, eventually it bothers you walking, and then finally it bothers you all the time, including when you're trying to sleep. The pain is worse with weight bearing, and it's worse with hip motion, especially internal rotation. So Lori's going to demonstrate internal rotation of her hip. This motion is usually particularly painful if there's an issue with the femoral neck. It's very important that if you have any of these symptoms or are suspicious that you could have this injury, that you stop training immediately and see your physician. Um, this is a picture, of an x-ray of the hip, and this is the femoral neck right through here. Uh, it's where the uh, femur comes up and then the femoral neck goes to the femoral head that actually attaches uh, to the pelvis to make the hip joint. The injury we're talking about occurs right through here. As this demonstrates, this is a normal x-ray, and as this demonstrates, stress fractures usually don't show up on regular x-rays. So if you go to your doctor with a possibility of a stress fracture, they'll order one of two tests. This is called a bone scan, and this demonstrates a, a black spot right here in this femoral neck and that is uh, consistent with a stress fracture in that area. This normal side here you can see does not have that black spot. And you can also see this on an MRI, and this is a picture of an MRI. And if you look right here, you can see a line that goes through that bone, whereas here on the normal side, there's not a line. And this is consistent with a stress fracture running through that femoral neck. Um, if you do have a stress fracture and it involves the underside of the femoral neck, which we call the compression side, that usually can be treated without uh, what we call conservatively, without surgery. Um, people have to get onto crutches and stay on crutches until they have no pain at all and then gradually they can start working back to normal activities, but it's rare that they would return to running um, before three months or longer. Uh, on the other hand, if the uh, stress fracture involves the upper side, of the femoral neck involves this area or goes all the way through the femoral neck, which was demonstrated on those pictures, uh, then that has to be fixed with surgery and these three large screws are placed across the femoral neck to hold that together. Um, obviously this is something that you'd rather avoid as a runner and so it's important if, if you think you could have this injury uh, to bring it to your doctor's attention. Next we're going to move on to knee injuries and we're going to deal with two common uh, knee problems that we see in runners. One is